Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. Wow. 19? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean. Man, the floodgates are open. Wow. The gates are open. Man, do they have some flying creatures I want to talk about this week. In Which all first? the color, I don't know. How about your favorite colors? You want to start that flying creature first? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, Nicol Bolas, the Ravager. Yeah. yeah. I think bears some discussion. And the crazy thing about him is he's part of a cycle. Okay. So, wait, was, part of a cycle? He is. Oh uh, yes, the cycle of Elder Dragons. Not a. Uh, he's because he's the only double flip card in the set. But he's the only one that actually ascends. All the other Elder Dragons are back in new forms that seem pretty sick. Yeah, so, but they don't flip into a Planeswalker. Only Nico Bolas arises like that. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's worth talking about to start, in my opinion. So, no question. Nico Bolas, the Ravager. He's uh, one in a Grixis, so one blue, black, red. So four mana for a 4-4 four, four flying when Nicol Bolas the Ravager enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. So four, okay. four, four for Flyer for four with an additional ability. Not With this color combination, not necessarily writing home you know, about how great he is, but also not off the list, right? Like, like eh, think about this for a second. He's real. A 4-4 four, four Flyer that makes him discard a card? Isn't yeah. that great? I it's it's he's not like crazy right because he's three colors what? right so isn't that that's already crazy okay so let's say you've got the the phoenix right the phoenix is a high tippity top defining metagame card and it's a four three flyer and the card that it gets you instead of you getting a card immediately you got to wait until they actually kill it, and even then you don't always get the card. And yeah. now, granted, this guy's three colors, but he's also a 4-4, and the difference between a 4-4 legend and a 4-3, like, that's so night and day. Oh, because Nico, of, like, a braids and anything like that? Lightning strike, all that. And, like, uh, I... I don't know. I think that to me, he's there without the other ability. Okay. Well, wait, there's more. Yeah. So, so, all right. So I'm not against you, right? I, I just think, I just don't, I'm just not super enthusiastic about him on his front face. Right. But I can see it. Like, I mean, he's got two sweet. Plus we were going to play Grixis anyway. Four, four body for four. <laughs> Flying is a good addition at four mana. And Legend then- is huge because of, uh, stuff like Yogmoss Vile Offering. Oh, uh, maybe we could see some time walking though. Karns, Karns, is it Karns Temporal Sundering? Oh yes, that. I mean, yes, you're right. Legend is also a bonus, but forget about all that for a second. He's got a he's got a pretty good body, you know, flying discarding package at four mana to begin with. But wait, there's more for an additional four Grixis. So four. Uh, blue, black, red, so basically a cruel ultimatum cost. Once he's already in play, he has the ability exile Nico Bolas. Other Nico Ra- Bolas. Yeah, yeah, the Ravager. Then return him to the battlefield transformed under his owner's control. Activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. Man, why did they have to add that? That would have been Please. this would have been the most unreal Get out of there. If they Get out of there. That's the, that's the fakest stuff. You There's no, the, the whole double face cards flipping in the middle to change the resolution. No, forget all that. What I'm saying is that this Planeswalker for just seven mana, which, by the way, is the turn after you Karn's Temporal Sundering. <laughs> yeah, they just made these cards for each other, right? You know what I mean? Like, you're like, you on turn four, you Nico Bullis, they discard a card, then they kill it. Then you, you're like, oh, no, 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 okay. no, no, no Patrick, you got to do it turn five so that you can pierce them and break their heart. Right. Like, no, 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 no. On turn five, I'm casting the Yogmoss Vile Offering uh-oh. since I also have like a Pia or a Baral or something. And so then the Nico Bolas comes back. And then on turn six, Karn's Temporal Sundering, which, by the way, when you bounce your opponent's card, you you know, sometimes then, then you play Nico Bolas that same turn and you get the card. 
my friend, the way that you're describing this, we all will be playing Grixis. Like, <laughs> sounds... Dude, so when he flips, though, this planeswalker keeps it real. Nico oh, Bolas, whoa. the Arisen. So Nico Bolas, the Arisen, it may look like he's a seven-cost planeswalker because you paid seven when you flipped it, but dear Lord. So he starts with seven loyalty. So and he has four, start, right? four abilities. Well, not just four uh, abilities, uh, not just seven loyalty, but you can plus two to draw two cards. So he's at nine, and you're drawing two <laughs> cards a turn. With wow! Three cards a turn, right? Like two extra, right? Three a turn, right? So then his minus three ability, deal ten to target creature or planeswalker. What? Like he starts with seven, he's got enough to do twenty. Out the gate. <laughs> so how you does just, he do it? Is he breathing fire on them? What's his? What's his? Because he's a yeah. He, he yeah. He breathes the like blue lightning fire stuff. It's like magical blue lightning fire. All right, and then basically he's just doing his other ultimate as his second of four abilities, and then his minus four ability put target creature or planeswalker card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. That's the one that gets me. This is crazy. Like, because the cost savings potential on this card, well, you know, you could just have another super powerful uh, planeswalker. So, for example, let's say you're like the other Nico Bolas in your graveyard. You're like, all right, for my first trick, I'm going to minus three, kill your awesome thing. And for my second trick, I'm just going to get the other Nico Bolas. Perfectly hit seven, and then I have a different Nico Bolas. You know, something like that. Something powerful. Or you're just doing it like he's got seven loyalty to start. You're like, oh, minus four. I've still got three loyalty. I can draw cards. I can kill something. But I've, I've also super man efficiently gotten like a Liliana or a whatever you well, want. So let's say they killed your first Nico Bolas and they dropped another one and flipped it. When you flip the Nico Bolas, if you want, you can just minus four and get the other Nico Bolas back. The Nico Bolas, the Ravager. So that you have him play Nico Bolas, the Ravager and... Uh, also, Nico Bolas the Arisen. Oh, that's so awesome! Right, because they're both Nico Boluses, but one is a a, a planeswalker, one is a creature, so they're not right. they're not fighting each other. Okay. Right, it's that's like search cool. for his Kanta stuff, you know? Yeah, that's real cool. And then uh, another one. Imagine if you just Nico Bolas, and then you just get back Liliana. <laughs> <laughs> and then your Liliana just gets back something else, right? Uh, like, I was, I, that's what I was really thinking. That Liliana was the was the way we were going to go on this one. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you got to remember because you can't Nico Bolas the Arisen back another Nico Bolas the Arisen, since when he dies, he'll flip back into the Ravager. But like uh, the put target creature or Planeswalker card gives you such a line of insurance, so that you can just keep going. Uh, even if your opponent has some sort of uh, planeswalker removal, because uh, remember, you can sometimes it's going to come up where you just drop Nico Bolas the Ravager and then flip it immediately for eleven. Uh, one more thing you can do with Nico Bolas the Arisen here is uh, if you've got a Teferi, you know, Oath of Teferi, you can yes. just go Nico Bolas twenty, taste it. Well. Um... Speaking of tasting it, how about that minus 12? Exile all but the bottom card of target player's library. <laughs> so, well, that is extremely <laughs> profound of a finisher. Who sits around and draws six extra cards with Nico Bolas when they've got this? You know what that is? That's insurance against people that gain a lot of life. Well, Or I have, you know... I think, like, let's say you've just got the the board is yours, right? You've you've got your sweltering sons or your bantu or whatever. You know, you 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 stabilize the board. Now is the time we're just going to draw some cards at plus two, plus two, plus two. Keep keep our hand full of permission so that it doesn't get out of hand, and then just one move, headshot. Sure. Well, here's one for you. What if you do it to yourself? And the reason you do it to yourself is because you just scryed your nexus of fate to the bottom. That's the five blue blue instant take an extra turn after this one. If nexus of fate would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal nexus of fate and shuffle it into his owner's library. Well, if you put your if you put your nexus of fate on the bottom of your deck and then you exile your own deck, 
you're going to get to take all the turns. That is true. <laughs> well, you just have a Nico Boas at ultimate. Um, and sometimes, you know, like if your opponent's got hex proof, sometimes you got to do it. I think it's, I mean, I just think that's probably going to be one of the things people want to try to do. But besides which, those are just both cards people are going to want to try to play. I think Nexus of Faith probably a pretty cool card anyway. But Nico Bolas, as which, by the way, I'm a buyer. I'm a buyer on Nico Bolas. Put me down for buying on Nico Bolas. Specifically, I'm particularly interested in the interaction with Nico Bolas and Legendary Sorceries. But uh, there are other Elder Dragon Legends to consider. What do you think of Chromium, Chromium the Mutable, which is the four white, blue, black, seven, seven, flash, can't be countered, flying, and you can discard a card until end of turn, Chromium becomes a human with base power and toughness one, one, loses all abilities, but gains hexproof. And it can't be blocked this turn. Um, that's kind of a real interesting and cool ability. Because, uh, like, it, it's, 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 it's just, I think, flavorful. Um, probably it's practical, right? Like, if you're... Extremely! Are you you know, ca- if you, oh, yeah. If your opponent's throwing a whatever kind of removal spell, commit to memory at your chromium, it doesn't matter what size it is, right, when it, when it gains the hexproof. Uh, I think this card is, I think it's, it's real interesting. Like it's in Esper colors, right? So people are playing Esper, you know, the, the non chain whirling folks right now are, a lot of them are playing Esper. Uh, Do they want a seven? Well, if they want a seven, uh, when do they want the seven? This card is insane. Absolutely insane in a control mirror match, right? Like even if it's only a sideboard card, Sign Dude, me up. Flash think about and can't okay, be countered and hexproof I, this, at will. This is not a, only a cyborg card. Compare this card to Sphinx of the Last Word. This is a seven-seven flying flash. That's so good at killing planeswalkers. That's where I think like your opponent attacks with a glory bringer, and then you just FTK it. You're like, boom, drop chromium, eat your glory bringer. Uh, I like it. I don't think I like it enough to actually commit this slot to main deck. Um, my opinion I, on... I bet, sh- I bet it'll show up. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, I, I celebrate... My soul celebrates these guys who want to play Esper, right? But they're already, like, gear hulking torrentially and the scarab godding. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. They were Sphinx of the Last Wording. They were not in the main deck. They never yeah, were. Oh, that. yes. They, oh, people were. People did sometimes. Maniacs, not? More often than not, they wouldn't. But this card is much better than Sphinx of the Last Word. I think. Yeah, we'll see. We'll is, see. I don't know that. I don't know that it is, it's far from a slam dunk. So we're probably oh, talking about one degree. To me, I think it's a cyborg card more than 50%. I just would argue that. It'll show up uh, a not insignificant amount in main decks for some metagames. You know, like it's, but you're right. It's much more of a cyborg card. Although, if you can take advantage of it being a legend or a dragon, I mean, I super disagree. I think it's a super slam dunk. Three of plus, just not. No, I'm saying I meant a, not a slam dunk to be in the main deck. Oh, of I course, see. it's a slam dunk in the sideboard. I'm with you. Uh, it's a slam dunk for sure in the sideboard. I just meant that it's a main deckable card, in my opinion. It's just not a slam dunk in the main deck. So, there you go. <laughs> there are more Dragon Legends than <laughs> Palladium Moors, the Ruiner, the Brian Kibler of Elder Dragon Legends. This ish. Th- they made it look like Brian Kibler. That's Kibler. If I've ever seen a picture of him. So three red, green, white for a six-six flying vigilance trample. And it has hex proof if it hasn't dealt damage yet. So we've got ourselves uh, sort of, in some ways, almost like a Dragon Lord Ojitai adjacent threat. Yeah. You know, you get to you get to just drop it, have it be hex proof, and then you get to untap, and then do whatever. Yeah, it's a great defender, right? Because if you can resolve it, it's not going anywhere because it starts off with hex proof. 
Uh, so it's going to be resilient. Uh, it's it's probably bigger than whatever they've got at the at that point in the game. I can't easily remove it with point removal. Uh, and then it plays offense defense after after you've swung. Uh, it loses hexproof, but it's still a six six flyer with a uh, with a bunch of abilities. Um, I think this card is high role player. It's not. I'm not seeing where it's gonna. It's not a slam dunk to me like Chromium. I, yeah, I have it being a little more fringe, somewhere between fringe and lo- role player. It's got uses. It's just I think it's going to be tough because of the amount of other competition. Well, what I'm thinking is when do I want to play Naya, right? If I'm if I'm going Naya, what are the incentives that I'm going to go for? Um, is this a you know? Let's say I want to play. Well, Naya. you like Carnage Tyrant, right? I love Carnage Tyrant. Right. As long as as long as you can live without the uncounterable part, this card is much better than Carnage Tyrant. But I only ever want to play Carnage Tyrant sometimes. The uncounterable part. <laughs> Also, the Carnage Tyrant doesn't give away his hexproof after one hit. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm willing to splash for Carnage Tyrant, which I, is a, a deep splash given the number of green pips. But uh, it, it, I, I want it for the uncounterable, not for the, uh, not for the body. Palladium Wars is also good with legendary uh, sorceries like uh, Dahlia's Inferno. You know, like because if it being a hexproof threat, you can set it in play. Do the and have reliable that you're you know that you have a legend to power it up. Do your inferno and then get down to attacking. You know. So I think this one's solid. Role player is probably a good description. But what about Vavictus Asmati the Dire? Three black, red, green for a six-six flyer. That uh, when it attacks, each for each player choose target permanent that player controls. Those players sacrifice those permanents. Each player who sacrificed a permanent this way reveals the top card of their library and puts it onto the battlefield if it's a permanent. Um, you got to aim well with Vivictus Asmati, right? I, I, I can see this backfiring sometimes. Well, you, you get to do it to yourself as well. So, like, I think it's actually pretty dope. Like, let's say your deck is, like, mostly permanents, right? Yep. Being able to just know that you can upgrade a land each turn into, uh, you know, 60, 60% of a threat, that's interesting. Particularly if you have some way to look at the top of your library, like that green four drop from uh, Almond Cut Block. But then what's more, if you are going after your opponent, that's not that bad of a roll of the dice. You get to pick their best permanent Whatever type it is. Oh, no, I think it's it's a solid not annihilator, right? Like, you can take out a really good thing with it. I'm just saying I can imagine it backfiring. That's all. Sure, because sometimes it's, it's they have awesome Emrakul. Most of the time. Sometimes they just have Emrakul or something. Yeah, they do. Like, oh, how there's do there's going to be some bad beat stories about this. But, you know, most of the time I think he's going to do what you want him to do. Uh, I think he is probably... A solid payoff, uh, you know, for for a deep mana investment. But the lack of, you know, Palladium Wars and um, Chromium, and to a lesser degree, Nicol Bolas, the Ravager, defend themselves, right? Like, Chromium can gain Hexproof, Palladium Wars starts off with Hexproof. Nicol Bolas is disarming the opponent, right? You know, taking potentially a removal card out of their hand. Vixus is Mahdi, just a body. Um, it's a big body, but... Could you know? Could be shot out of the sky. Now, uh, I don't believe that they've actually revealed an Arcades Sabbath, so it'll be interesting to see if uh, if I assume that there must be one, but I haven't seen it revealed yet. So, has your reading on Vivian Reed changed at all with the revelation of these many powerful flying creatures this week? I don't know. She, she she's shooting. What do you mean, Marie? Yeah, she's okay. I thought she was better than uh, Nissa. Um, so yeah, uh, she's good. She's fine. I don't know if you're going to think of this as heretical, but none of those is even, in my opinion, the most powerful uh, flying creature that was revealed this week. <laughs> yeah. Any guesses? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh no, I don't know. Is it, you know, a Pegasus Courser, maybe? Or, you know, uh, you know, maybe 2-2 uh, two, two Flying gets plus one plus one, you know, Prowess? 
Uh, no. Close, close. Uh, similar color, similar color. Uh, I was thinking perhaps of the greatest of gnarled masses, Resplendent Angel. Oh, that's weird. Huh. <laughs> Never would have guessed. Never so would have guessed. Huh? <laughs> one white white for a 3-3 three, three flyer at the beginning of each end step. If you gain five or more life this turn, create a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token with vi- flying and vigilance. And then she also has three white, 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 or, or he or whoever. Uh, it has three white, white, white until end of turn. Resplendent Angel gets plus two, plus two, and gains life link. When I first read this card, I didn't even realize initially that there was the three white, white, white ability. I already thought this card was insane. This card is crazy. Three, three flying for three. It, with, and there's so much cool life gain that you can play, even without the pumping ability. It's, is Lyra Dawnbringer good with this card? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Is Lyra Dawnbringer good? I, or any of the, the random... She attacks cards? for five, gains you five, and then you get another angel, and you even get bonus. Plus one, plus one for your angel token. Plus one, plus one, one for the resplendent angel. You know, you're just doing it. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> like, But what about like revitalize, right? And renewed faith, like... Would you just play those cards alongside? Just cast a renewed faith and just like ah, oh, gain six and a four and a Sarah Angel. That seems well, this, like a very efficient, uh, very efficient play to me. Well, this is a slam dunk for the Lyra Dawnbringer build of Lich's Mastery to come. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, uh, it is. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's cool that they're making uh, like three threes worth killing with like. Like they, they have powerful removal cards like a Braid and Lightning Strike, and it's nice that they're actually making powerful threats that you want to play that uh, Lightning Strike and a Braid are good against. Really? Because I, I, I hadn't thought that there were any perhaps three casting cost three threes that anyone would want to play in Standard right now. Well, it's different if you put some kind of a cheesy enters the battlefield trigger. Yeah, it's you know? different. Although it's not that different given that, like, M19 has another Goblin Chain Whirler, Plague Mare, one black black for a 2-2 that can't be blocked by white creatures. When Plague Mare enters the battlefield, creatures your opponent controls gets, get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Well, if there's one thing that I know about Standard, it's that they're trying real hard to keep Llanowar Elves from being too overpowered. <laughs> He's still good. He's still good. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but... He's not taking over the world yet. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think this card's nearly in the same zip code as Goblin Chain Whirler. I think the difference Which between Angel, th- you mean? No, Goblin Chain Whirler in terms of the minus one, minus one versus oh, deal one. Oh, the- they have a similar output. I think Plague Mare is a little bit more of a cyborg card. I think that uh, Goblin Chain Whirler. I mean, a three-three first strike is so much better than a two-two that can't be blocked by white creatures. Oh, there, there, there's. They're zip and, codes away from And then the, the chain whirler is badonkadonk. The uh, chain whirler also goes upstairs and pings all the walkers. Yeah, it, So it, I'm I'm on I'm on I'm on the goblin chain whirler side of the plague mirror goblin chain whirler debate. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think that you should feel proud of being on that side. You're not alone. People will nice. back you up on that one, Patrick. Nice. Nice. Uh, so there's actually a different flyer. Uh, God, where where is it? Is this... Uh, I, I just wanted to call this one out, even though it's not a constructed card, because I just thought it was interesting. I don't recall Magic really dabbling in this too much. Spark Tongue Dragon is a three red red, three three flying dragon that when it enters the battlefield you can pay two and a red if you do it deals three damage to any target so effectively kicker but spark tongue dragon the part that makes it such a twist is that this is a common oh i hadn't noticed that it was a common that's wild right i mean this is going to be a very high high draft pick right like i mean yeah i hadn't this changes like a lot of stuff for me. Uh, That's very that. weird. That's very different, right? Right. So, uh, just wanted to point that out that it sort of speaks to a different draft format to come. Uh, does Bone Dragon do anything for you? Speaking of flyers, that's the three black black, also a dragon. 
Dragon Skeleton. It's a 5-4 flyer that you can pay 3 black black and exile 7 other cards, not just creatures, cards, from your graveyard to return Bone Dragon from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. I like this card. Um, I mean, obviously... Uh, five four for five with flying is it's a that's a solid okay um but just the resilience on this i think that maybe maybe an anti-grinding sideboard card we've certainly played worse and 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 seen success with uh with that i i I don't think this is like a a whiz bang main deck card but certainly if you're playing against somebody who's just like mono removal uh this is the kind of card that when when paired with other things they might might want to destroy and therefore put into the graveyard or a bunch of spells or some card drawing uh, gives them problems. Also, separately, uh, if the if you're worried about permission, right, uh, the ability is uh, it's not a, a spell, right? You just right. So you know, I think I think this is like a, a kind of a niche sideboard card, uh, but perhaps it will be uh, a popular niche sideboard card depending on on. Uh, what the control elements in the format look like. The reanimation card that I was more excited about was Isareth the Awakener. This is the, uh, you know, in the market, for, or like in the, the topic of three threes for three. Uh, Isareth the Awakener is one BB for a three three legendary human wizard, and he's got Death Touch, or she, yeah. So uh, when Isareth the Awakener attacks, you may pay X. When you do, return target creature card with converted mana cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield with a corpse counter. If that creature would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. Uh, this card is cool. Um, it's so 3-3 like three, a- three Death Touch is already like, you know, it's not the, the worst. Market, right? And it's a legend, so you can do the Ogmos Vile Offering. I mean, this is like a must kill, right? Like, you know, oh, yeah. when it comes out, you got to shoot it before it gets an attack. Because even if you're just getting like, I'm just going to say like a Lana War Elf or whatever, it's just a freebie. It's just solid. Just think about how much better this card is than Alicia who smiles with de- at death. You know, like this card can go all the way up. Yeah. That's like, that's like pretty intense. And the other thing is, it's like very mana efficient, right? Like just paying X... Mm-hmm. I mean, like you would have you would have just paid paid a more difficult version of that same X uh, at retail, and this is like the card advantage version. Sure. So yeah, this one seems kind of interesting, and I particularly just think that Legend is going to be a key component for that card. Like, I think that's a big part of the recipe for what's going on with that one. So, uh, in terms of flyers, it seems like they are definitely shifting the focus to print more mid-range size flying creatures that, uh, you know, make the battle on, making flying less unblockable. I think this is a really cool twist, but I think you're right in terms of both the implications for uh, flying, you know, anti-flying cards across the board. But also uh, specifically with uh, Vivian, uh, Vivian of Arcbo or or whatnot, or whatever her name Vivian is, Reed. Viv- Vivian Reed, Vivian Arcbo, I guess is a little bit more pre deck. But so there was a different green card that I'm I'm pretty excited about uh, that that was revealed this week. It seems pretty awesome to me. I was just going to try to get your take on this one, Elvish Clan Caller. So, mm. GG for a 1-1. One, one. Other elves you control get plus one, plus one. Um, and so that's not that crazy, right? Because uh, it doesn't even pump itself. Uh, so it's a 1-1 one, one for two. Well, it's only one smaller than like a Wizen Zen type of lord. You yeah, know? But it's it's super cheap, right? Like we don't, oh, yeah. we don't see, you know, most, most lords that are doing this um, cost three. Uh, and uh, elves especially can, can deploy can deploy faster and then we you know there's also depending on format right you you can you've got these elves that are making more elves uh so uh just any ability to get material onto the battlefield faster uh is going to have a, a a faster impact on on the buffing but then elvish clan caller has a second ability which is 4gg tap search your library for a card named elvish clan caller put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle your library so it's also a draw engine 
right? So once you've got two of them, then they are actually buffing each other. Um, but ah, uh, the pack rat effect. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, what do you think about this card? It seems it seems awesome to me. Yeah, I think this is gonna. This is why would you not play this in modern? I think you would. <laughs> I think if you're in the market for elves, uh, I mean, there's so many one one elves uh, for one that that tap for mana that are playable right now. Uh, they, you can accelerate into the searching, or you could just like drop one of these and you know be attacking for for an outsized amount of power early on. Uh, seems very solid. Sure, sure. Uh, where do you think? You, I mean, what about in standard though? Do you think that this will show up at all? Uh, well, I mean, it's just the chain whirler question, right? Like, there are a lot of really powerful. Uh, one toughness green creatures that you might want to play some of which are also elves right um but you know it's how many of them (laughs) like if you go like you know land of war elves and elvish clan caller the land of war elves actually becomes a 2-2 but when your opponent plays chain whirler the clan caller will die and then the land of war elf will die right so it's like that that's just like a domino effect that you don't want to be on the wrong side of I, i I don't know. It's just it's such a it's such a limiting factor on the format, in my opinion. Well, here's one that I I, I think is gonna for sure make it. Vine mare, two green green five three hex proof, and it can't be blocked by black creatures. Five three hex proof upside. Wow! So it's like a juggernaut body. Uh, it's like a bristling hydra, but. Like less vulnerable, it doesn't have the shields down moment to turn you know the moment you play it, and not being able to be blocked by black creatures is something, particularly in this world of the scarab god and and so on. And you know, Nicol Bolas is going to be a black creature some of the time. <laughs> uh, so there are some reprints actually that I thought were going to have tremendous impact on the format. Yeah, absolutely tremendous. Uh, I would start with Crucible of Worlds. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Evolving Wilds is always there. You know, we're like, it's it sees some play, um, but you know, we're you know, eh, we play it, we don't play it. But this is a really great reason to play Evolving Wilds. But this card also makes any of those memorials way better, and also makes. Um, uh, Field of Ruin way better, but that's none of that. Which all those things, which were already playable or very good in the case of Field of Ruin, that's not even what I think is exciting. What I think is exciting is that three casting cost five five the the G two guy that lets you play multiple lands per turn. Yeah, that guy, uh, Crucible Worlds. That guy, maybe some of that's pretty good. Wilds action like that. What about the deserts though? The deserts, the deserts. Yeah. yeah, that's good with Crucible Worlds. Plus, you can get up to an, having enough land in place so that you know you can use like Hour of Promise so that you can actually attack with your five five sometimes. Yeah, that's I. I'm there. I mean, how many Crucibles do you play? Is the only question. You know, like, <laughs> like you, you can't really. Play that's the only question. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think I think that this card is going to have a profound impact on deck design because it's well, really just going to open up stuff that we're you not think, doing it wait i mean do you think that people are going to play this a lot more than the green creature that does this yeah i mean i don't know this card is like a proven pedigree in in uh in and that's true so does the green creature incidentally uh but it's you know it's just tougher in in standard well it, it'll end up depending on what the format ends up looking like of course but like uh i don't know to me they seem I I, th- I mean I think Crucible Worlds might be longer on the nostalgia, but it'll have spots where you can play it in some sort of a not green control deck that just wants to take advantage of not playing with green creatures. All right. Uh, well, there are a bunch of really awesome uh, reprints. I think maybe chief among them has got to be Reclamation Sage. Huh? Really? Okay. You're, you're a big Reclamation. Tell me about why you like Reclamation Sage so much in this format. I mean, there, it's, it's just... So Reclamation Sage is 2 and a G for a 2-1 Elf Shaman 
When it enters the battlefield, you may destroy target artifacts or enchantment. It, it could beat artifacts or enchantments. Right, because we already have the 2-2 version that hits artifacts, and then even gives you the bonus of making their future artifacts come into play tapped, enter the battlefield tapped, right? But ability to hit enchantments, like white decks, for example, are just all about enchantments. Uh, they've got all kinds of cast outs and bindings and... Search for Azkanta. All that kind of stuff, right? So ability to hit enchantments, solid. Uh, it's a creature, right? So you can play it with uh, Adventures Impulse, etc., uh, there's just a whole, a whole school of uh, of deck design that, you know, if you're going to be on the on the right side of uh, the uh, the chain whirler again, but then uh, I get it. This this is another one toughness creature, but at least it gets its money before the chain whirler gets it. Uh, so, I think that that's one. But then also scape shift. What about it? Scape shift, Patrick. What are you doing with scape shift in standard? Um. Setting up Crucible of Worlds, I'm thinking, right? <laughs> That's a lot of fuel for my Crucible of Worlds. Uh, yeah, okay, dude. No, that's cool. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, Just I combo. See. I think you I, – I mean, it seems to me that, like, for the time being anyway, that, like, what's popping with Scape Shift is some sort of uh, either whenever you play a land, draw a card type of deal or uh, play all the lands from your graveyard. Yeah, I, I, I don't – think scape shifts is going to be utterly busted in standard uh but i i don't know it's Play it the land utterly busted in, in other formats so dude i th- here's a card for you this one is this is totally a michael j type of card lightning mare and it's funny by the way that this is now the type of card that is a michael j card because in another life you were a very different mage but lightning mare is red red for a three one can't be countered can't be blocked by blue, blue creatures and then you can pay one in a red to give it plus one, plus zero in tone of turn as much as you want. So it's a 3-1 uncounterable, can't be blocked by blue creatures, uh, plus you even have a bonus fire-breathing type ability. Wow, this is a, a Michael J. type card. I think this is more a legacy or modern card for me than, um, than a standard card, though. This is just a, a, this is perfect for legacy. Yeah, it's pretty um, good. Yeah, I, I would have loved this back when people were counterbalancing you more. You're just vexing shushering. <laughs> the shusher. I never went low enough to play the shusher, but uh, P. Sully tried to get me to go shusher, but I, I couldn't do it. Uh, but this guy is no shusher. He's got he's three one with fire breathing. You knew the shusher, and this is no shusher, huh? No. Um, but there there's some mad mad red cards that are at least you know. They're powerful, interesting to talk about, uh, big in some cases. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. There's so much competition at the top end right now. Like in other universes, some of these cards would be just completely unreal. And Are I you talking like, about, like, Lathless Dragon Queen? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, four red red for a 6-6 six, six flying legendary creature dragon. She's a 6-6 six, six flyer that whenever another non-token dragon, such as Nico Bolas, whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a 5-5 five, five red dragon creature token with flying. And then also she has AoE fire breathing. You can pay one in red and all your dragons get plus one, plus zero until end of turn, including herself. Like, this is an insane card, right? Like, and I'm not sure that anyone will ever play it. Like, that's... Uh, like, I, I, I bet this one shows up. I don't think it's like... I mean, it's like border... It's between fringe or short. But I, I actually... I think this one's got chances. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, in another... in On the merits, like, just... There's so many times, just like, oh, wow, let's ramp up into this insane 6-6 six, six for 6. Did we untap with this in play? Oh, I just have three dragons now. Right, like it. I don't know. Lathless seems to me like she's like Charles Barkley, right? Like Barkley never got a title. <laughs> that that. See, I think she's more likely to get a title. Yeah, I just think that it's like she'll be like, uh, she's keeps good company. She's got you know, to be like more she, likely to get a title than Charles Barkley at this point. She'll, she'll just be kicking it with Glorybringer and Nico Bolas and some other dragons, and then they randomly just have one Lathless in their deck, which they need another legend. <laughs> I mean, Lathless into Glorybringer does seem pretty appetizing. Uh, does Seder Enchanter do anything for you? One green white for a 2-2 whenever you cast an enchantment spell, draw a card. 
Yeah, I, I, I was never really that kind of a person. Uh, but is this just like a value card in standard? You play this alongside all the white enchantments that remove things. It's like, I don't yeah, know. Probably. It's probably, that's what I think it's role is uh, because it's, it's more expensive than the ones you play in bigger formats and way less hex proof. So <laughs> way, way less, less hex proof and more expensive. Uh, well, so. no, 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 no. It's like a Vendern enchantress, but it's just bigger. Uh, what do you think of Diamond Mare as a possible, like, if you had, like, so let's say you're playing Lich's Mastery, or you're at least just thinking about it, like, you, like you do, and you got your Diamond Mare, and maybe you've got the, that 0-4 from Amonkhet block, and you got them both on the same color, and you're just, like, <laughs> going at it, it's just, like, Throne of Bone Necro all over again. Uh... Hey man, I can just imagine saying white with Diamond Mare and then casting that 3-3 three, three flyer the next turn and gaining a life. And then like, what if I had two Diamond Mares and I just cast the card that was like, you know, gain three, draw a card? Eh? I just gained five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I see it. I actually think Diamond Mare is going to see play in that white deck. It's like 1-3. It can contain, you know, call it a... An Earthshaker can are pretty well. It can contain a Bowmat Courier really well. Um, like, that deck's getting most of its money in the sky, right? And you actually, maybe you just need some some ground stuff to bridge so that you can hit your your five casting costs or four casting cost angels. I could see it. Maybe. Dude, there, we've already talked about some of the goblins in this set, but there's a super sick one, Dark Dweller Oracle. One in a red for a 2-2 two, two Goblin Shaman. You can pay what, Carless and Sacrifice a Creature. Exile target... Or, I'm sorry, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. So, like, from the school of Vizara Seers, instead of scrying, you pay one extra so that you could just play the card if you want. So you can do this at instant speed? Yeah. So if somebody's going to kill your creature, you can just... Yeah. Roll the dice. See what you got. Yep. But you can also sacrifice all your goblin tokens and just keep going. And you can, like, fuel your uh, god pharaoh's gift. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And remember, this is effectively scrying, too, because you're, you are exiling the top card anyway. Yeah, you're moving so, like, it over. You're moving it over. So you are getting to new stuff if you don't see the thing you really want. And you can keep going. And the stuff you, even though you're exiling the top card of your library, the creatures you're sacrificing do go to your graveyard for the God Pharaoh's gift. So, um, and it's a two-two for two, right? Yeah, like, right. You're not paying much. Yeah, and red. That's not that's not too bad. <laughs> and remember, the best God Pharaoh's gift deck from the last uh, format was a Goblin build. Um. Yeah, I, th- I think that Dark Dweller Oracle will, in fact, be sweet. Like, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just super solid. Just, you know, some uh, just a little extra card advantage. Um, and it, like you said, especially if you're, you've got some token production, uh, this is uh, a very good way to do it. Uh, I bet you're not going to be that into it, but maybe you would. What do you think of Shield Mare? The one white, white, two, three that can't be blocked by red creatures when it enters the battlefield or becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls gain three life? Uh, I mean, I could be into it. Um, I don't know. Like, it's it's a little small for its cost, <laughs> you know, for what we would want to be defending against. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm a sucker for, like, if you could gain life twice with this thing... I mean, like, I, I feel like it's done. It's 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 work. Yeah, how are you gonna do that? You know, it's gonna die. <laughs> it was like it was valiant in its efforts. Yeah, yeah. So you're right. you, I'm not super into it. What do you think of the new uh, back on the flyers tip? Remorseful Reverend, the one white two one flying spirit cleric. Sacrifice it to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. I mean, this card's spectacular, right? Two one flyer for one and a white with no drawback. 
In fact, and then it has the upside of Tormod's Crypt at will? Yeah, this seems like cross-format cross format role player at, is, its, is at the low end of its range, right? Yeah, I think so. I think the card looks re- just real solid. And I think real it's good. actually got... I think it's got a deceptive amount of play in in standard because of just how much it can be sitting in play, disrupting a the Scarab God or Torrential Gear Hulk. Like there's so many good white flyers and some some like blue flyers. You could play that uh, one in a blue enchantment that gives flyers buff, right? Like just you just crusade for flyers, right? Yeah, you know, whatever you're into. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of awesome flyers. That's, that's what I've been saying. Oh, you uh, can get this guy with Militia Bugler also, actually. I think that that's uh, it's kind of cool, right? Especially if you want to fight graveyards. Bugler can kind of tutor for him. So here's a really weird one. And I wonder if you can think of more applications for it. But it's the Miscaller. Blue for a 1-1 Merfolk Wizard. So that's two good types. Like, this is some straight-up good types. 1-1 one, one Merfolk Wizard, and you can, for zero mana, just at will, you can sacrifice it so that until end of turn, if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, exile it instead. And so what this means is that, like, for instance, let's say your opponent sacrifices their 0-1 egg and they get back their phoenix. Well, in response to that trigger, you miss caller, and now uh, the phoenix is exiled. Or let's say that they uh, play some sort of, like, let's say they want to reanimate a creature from their graveyard. You know? Miscaller. Just counter. Boom. So, Boom. But in, in modern, if this is sitting in play, you can stop Bloodgast. You can stop, uh, or Legacy for that matter. You can stop Sneak Attack. You can stop... Uh, any of those, any sort of reanimation, Gorio's vent, any sort of reanimation from the graveyard, or cheat into play from your hand or deck, whether it's show and tell, natural order, any of that stuff. For sure, this card is going to be cross format played, right? Like, uh, people play. They can't Merfolk tinker up the costs. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I wouldn't play, play Merfolk and Legacy, but people do. And, like, this is just a one one for one Merfolk, which is maybe on the small side for the Merfolk deck. Most of, like most of the beef in the Merfolk deck is just stompers, right? They're just all two two lords. So like every single every single guy buffs every other guy, right? Like that's that's how they mostly play. But they need some one drops, and if their one drop is countering sneak and show, like you could do worse. <laughs> like they're the only blue deck in the room with no permission, um, and so. I guess they have force of will, but it this seems like automatic whiz bang straight in that deck. So I wonder about some of the other uses in standard though, because it seems like the modern and legacy ones are kind of straightforward. But like, uh, for instance, what if you just blink your opponent's stuff? Oh, is there a? Uh, well, you're still using a card though, right? Like. I was thinking, like, if you have, like, a passive blinker that's not using any cards, like, you know, like, something like the Eldrazi Displacer, for sake of argument, then, the you know, the Miscaller could keep it, keep it away forever, but, you know, you're, you're losing, you're losing it after one activation. Well, I mean, they've printed cards in the past that could exile all your opponent's creatures, and then they all come back at the end of the turn. If they print something like that, this card is super dope with that, right? Hmm, Yeah. So you could trade one for many. That's uh, that's potentially strong. Sort of two for many, because you'd have to be doing oh, yeah, the you'd exile. Have to the other card, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then uh, obviously this card works well with um, any sort of uh, what. Well, it's weird. So it works well-ish with any of the sort of cast out type stuff for when your opponent gets out of it. What's weird is that uh, you. Don't actually stop Embalm or Eternalize with this card. That's definitely weird. Oh, because it's a token creature. Yeah, but whatever. I guess they, I mean, they spell it out. Um, what, what card are you most excited for in blue? You're saying besides Nico Bolas? Yeah, just in straight blue. 
you know, uh, I don't know. You know, uh, specifically for standard, take take your pick. <laughs> Out of curiosity, why 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 blue? Because uh, uh, do I have that kind of reputation? <laughs> or you got one in mind? For me, it's Omen Speaker. <laughs> but really, yeah, dude, that's Omen Speaker is your jam though. Oh, you put yeah. that card. Oh my god, did you rock that card? I, I I sided Omen Speaker in, and I I heard about it afterwards, right? Because I was playing my match, and Chris Pakula was. We were in Utah. Chris Pakula was watching me from behind, and he and he tweeted like Mike played his Omen Speaker. His opponent like basically fell out of his chair. His hand was like all foul tongue invocations because that's how he was going to beat my dragon deck. But now Omen Speaker was just sucking up all of his foul tongue invocations. It was over on turn two. <laughs> like, yeah, Omen Speaker does everything. He slows down red beaters and he just he gets you the land that you need to keep going or the spells that you need if you've got a handful of land that's his job and mm. he, he and you live and sometimes he gives you blue pips for uh for master of waves everything yeah yeah so this set is looking Looking pretty awesome. I'm pretty excited and uh, definitely looking forward to, in particular, figuring out how to use all these legends with the legendary sorceries that I think are just waiting to break. Well, don't forget that if you're going to play black, red, and blue together to have enough red so that you can play red, red, red on turn three and then, you know, red, red, black, blue one on turn four. Why do I need red, red, red on turn three? The chain whirler? Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I maybe I do, maybe I don't. Maybe it's legal, maybe it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Yeah. All right. See you next week, man. Bye bye. Come on.